Hi, and welcome to CF Online. If this is your first time with us, we want to thank you for joining us. We are in week five of our series called Ancient Stories. In this series, we are learning from relationships of the past so we can learn how to establish healthy relationships today. Also, whether you are joining us for the first time or you've been with us for a while, we would love to connect with you. And the best way to do that is by filling out a connection card. You can do that by texting CF Miami to 313131, and we will get you plugged in right here at Christ Fellowship. Now, if you are in the sixth through 12th grade or a parent of a sixth through 12th grader, or you know someone who is, CF Students Rally is happening October 22nd at 7.30 p.m. at the Palmetto Bay campus. And we're gonna be celebrating the 90s. That's right, now there's something I know about the 90s. All right, we're gonna have food, games, special rally merch, contests, high energy worship, and a powerful message by our West Kendall Students Director, Louis Valentin. Now parents, there is free bus transportation provided for each of the campuses, so make sure to fill out a bus form. For more information for the bus form, please visit cfmiami.org students. Also, if you can't make it in person, you can still join with a special live stream on our CF Students YouTube page. We have that, a YouTube page. So check out this video.
are surrendering all that we are.
Church family, I hope the song we just sang will be more than just words we say. I hope we put that in action and make room in every part of our lives for God. If you would like to know more about putting Jesus first in your life or taking your next step in your relationship with Him, we want to help you. You can text CF Miami to 313131 and fill out a connection card and we will connect with you. Church family, let me take a minute and rewind the clock to remind us of where we were and where God has taken us. Back in March 2020, we had to close the doors to our physical campuses because of COVID. But God still moved in our city and in our church during this time through online. And by God's grace and your generosity, we were able to reopen the doors to our physical campuses in October 2020, literally just a year ago. During this past year, adults, students, and kids have all been able to gather again in person and online to connect with each other. Also, we continue to serve our community in incredible ways. And new people came to our campuses, also joined in online and experienced the love of God for the first time. Today, we're celebrating all the things God did in our church online and on site this past year. We're celebrating this big milestone in our church's history. We also are encouraging you to continue making an impact at our local campuses, online, and in our city through your giving. You can join our church in helping others follow Jesus by texting CFGIVE to 313131. Thank you for your generosity and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that we've seen you do in this past year. It really is incredible when we start to take count of what you did. We thank you for the lives changed. We thank you for the opportunity that we had to really minister to our community. And we thank you for those that have been coming and those who continue to attend online as well. And thank you, Lord, for each one that gives. We pray that you would take the gifts and use them for your glory. We ask this in your name, amen. we need Jesus I'm not sure what you came in carrying today but I challenge you to lay it at his feet as we just lift up this song declaring that we need nothing else but him
church as we lift up this declaration let's mean it with our whole hearts come on lift your voice I just want you nothing else nothing else oh, nothing else nothing else but you Lord nothing can satisfy you in this life like Jesus Christ amen how many of you believe that today at all of our campuses come on and give Jesus a shot of praise amen well I want to take a moment and welcome all of our first-time guests if you're joining us at one of our campuses whether you're at West Kendall Doral Homestead Redland Core Gables or downtown or if you're watching us online uh, we want to say thank you so much for joining us today Christ Fellowship Palm Middle Bay can we give it up for them as loud as you can and today we continue this series called Ancient Stories. And we've been going through uh, some stories from the Old Testament, uh, mostly from the Old Testament, and learning some how to deal with different uh, family relationships. And so today uh, we're going to be learning about the story of Joseph. Not Mary and Joseph in the New Testament, but rather Joseph from the Old Testament. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to begin in verse 3. How many of you are ready? Yeah? All right. Awesome. Verse 3. Here's what the Word of God says. Now Israel, also Jacob, he had two names, Jacob and Israel, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. In other words, there was conflict between the 11 brothers and Joseph. Let's take a moment now and let us pray. Father God, we just come before you, Lord. And God, just like we sang now, nothing else can satisfy us like you, Jesus. Lord, we want more of you and less of us, Lord. Like your word says in John 3.30, Lord, may you increase so that we may decrease, God. And so, Lord, I pray that you speak to us today, Lord, through your word. God, Holy Spirit, convict us, Lord. Let us walk out of here different. We want to be transformed by the power of your spirit. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen and amen. You can have a seat now at all of our campuses. You know, I think that by now, most of you, if not all of you, you know that I love sports. And for me, my favorite sport is football. In fact, how many of you out there, you love football? Make some noise at all of our campuses. Make some noise. Yeah. It's the best time of the year because we are in the midst of football season. And even though our Dolphins are not playing well, still, we, I still enjoy watching uh, football. And earlier this year, I talked about the greatest basketball player to ever play basketball was Michael Jordan. 
But the greatest football player, I think, that to ever play the game of football, even though we're Dolphins fans, is probably Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> now, Tom Brady, before he went to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he played for the New England Patriots uh, for 20 seasons. And they accomplished probably one of the greatest dynasties to ever exist in the game of football. Because the New England Patriots and Tom Brady, they went uh, to 17 different, uh, they won 17 different division titles. Uh, they went to 13 different AFC championship games and they won six Super Bowls. But at the age of 42, in March of 2020, Tom Brady will make an announcement that shocked the entire football world. Tom Brady made the announcement that he would no longer play for New England. Instead, he went to play for Tampa Bay. Now you would think, wait a minute, this guy has played 20 seasons, he's 42 years old now, you would think that he would make it to the very end, that he would retire as the New England Patriots. And so this past Sunday, it was the epic showdown, many of you probably watched it, between Tom Brady and his former team, the New England Patriots. It was the coming back, coming back home, the prodigal son is back in New England. In fact, with that in mind, take a look at this video. Hello, it's me. I was wondering if after all these years you'd like to me. So hello from the other side. At least I can say that I've tried. And no matter who clearly doesn't take you apart anymore. All right, you can clap it up for that. Who would think that the Adele song was actually written to describe Brady and Belichick's relationship? You see, they went from playing with each other in the same team, being in the same sideline, to playing against each other. Now, I think that the question that many of us had the moment that Brady decided to leave the New England Patriots family is what would lead Pey uh, Bear Brady to leave New England? What would lead this guy, who is probably the best player to ever play the game of football, leave this organization and this dynasty that they built together? It was unresolved conflict. There was conflict between him and the New England Patriots organization. And they were unable to deal and manage the conflict that was between both parties. Now let me bring all of that over to our time today. Because don't miss the point in all this. Because just like conflict led to the destruction of one of the greatest dynasties of football time, just like that, Here's our big idea for this weekend. You see, conflict can lead to destroying our relationships in our family. Conflict can lead to destroying our relationships with a friend, with a coworker, with a boss, with a spouse, with your children, with your parents. And who knows, maybe you're here today and you're in the midst of intense conflict. Perhaps there is conflict at home. Perhaps there's conflict between you and your spouse, you and your parents, you and your children. So the question is, how do we deal with conflict? Well, we're going to find out today through the narrative of Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. And if you really understand this, it will transform the way that you live. And so we love to take notes here, so I want you to take out your Christ Fellowship app at all of our campuses, and I want to encourage you to take some notes today. Here's the first point that I want you to write down. Family conflicts are a part of life. Family conflicts are a part of life. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Here's what the Word of God says. Now Israel, Jacob, you know, he had two names, Jacob and Israel, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made him an ornate robe for him. Now, 
Let me give you a historical background so that we can understand better what is happening in Genesis chapter 37. I want to give you a little bit of a family tree here, starting from Abraham. We learned many weeks about Abraham, and Abraham had eight different sons, and one of them was Isaac. And so Isaac was the son of promise, and Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And this is who we're talking about, Jacob, uh, also known as Israel. And Jacob had 12 children with four different women. Two of them were their wives, and two of them were not his wives. And so Jacob has these 12 children, and the Bible says that Joseph was Jacob's favorites. And so this created conflict because Joseph actually had the long robe, and the Bible says that he wore this coat of many uh, colors. And so the problem is that back in those days, just to give you a little bit of a historical nugget here, back in those days, only the oldest son would wear this ornate robe. Only the oldest son would wear uh, this coat. And if you wore the robe, it meant that you did not have to do any manual labor. And so Jacob gives the robe not to his oldest son, Benjamin, but rather he gives it to one of his youngest son, who is Joseph. So this creates conflict. This creates beef bef between the 11 brothers and his little brother, uh, Joseph. So think about it this way. When all the other 11 brothers were out in the field working hard from morning to night, little Joey was back at home playing Fortnite, watching Netflix, probably eating some organic hummus and pita bread, you know, some of the good stuff. And all his other brothers were out in the field working hard. Joseph was probably the one that was going fishing with his dad. And so this created conflict between the 11 brothers and Joseph. They're like, wait a minute, that's not fair. Why is Joseph getting special treatment? Why is Joseph daddy's favorite? That's not fair. You see, they actually were jealous. The Word of God says that they were jealous of what Joseph had. They were jealous of the relationship between Joseph and his dad. In other words, they coveted the relationship that Joseph had between his father. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down as the next point for today. You see, oftentimes, here's what I want you to know, that coveting breeds conflict. Coveting breeds conflict. Think about this for a moment. It wasn't Joseph's fault that he was his dad's favorite. No, it's Jacob's fault. By the way, parenting 101, this is not a parenting message, but do not have any favorites, all right? I have three children. I really love my little girl. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I, I love them all. My favorite is whoever is listening that day. That's my favorite. I was just kidding. But, but listen, it is not Joseph's fault. The 11 brothers should have gone to Jacob, their dad, and said, hey, dad, hey, that's not fair. We're working hard. We're working for your business. We're out in the field while Joseph is out, and he's getting all these different things that we don't have. It is not Joseph's fault, but they coveted. They wanted what Joseph had, and what Joseph had was a special treatment with his father. You see, oftentimes, coveting initiates conflict. It breeds conflict. I have three children, Noah, Nathan, and Everly. And one of the things that my wife and I, we started doing recently is that we want to spend quality time, one-on-one -on -one time with each of our children. So I started taking them out on like a date or a hangout. And so one of my hangouts with, with my oldest son, Noah, was uh, several weeks ago. And so I started with my oldest son, Noah. And so I asked my oldest son, I said, hey, where, where do you want to go eat lunch? And he said, uh, Panera. And I'm like, okay, cool, cool, awesome. I guess he wants to eat healthy. And so we had some Panera. And so we go back home and we have a, a leftover bag from Panera. And so we go to the kitchen and I have the bag of Panera there. And my middle child, Nathan, sees the bag. He's like, that's not fair. Why did he get Panera? I want Panera now. Wait a minute. You didn't want a sandwich before. You didn't want a soup. You didn't want a piece of bread. You didn't want a salad. Now you want Panera because your oldest son, your oldest sibling, your older brother has Panera. You want what he has. What is that? That's coveting. Everything was good with you and your hubby until your best friend started talking about her, how amazing her husband is. 
oh, my hubby is amazing. He wakes up early every single day. He helps me put the children ready to, so they can go to school. And then he goes to work, and work is going amazing for him. He ma- he's making so much money. He keeps getting promoted, promotion after promotion. After a long day from work, he comes home, prepares a meal for them, then showers the children, and then he takes them to the bed, has a quiet time with them, prays, reads the Bible, tucks them into bed, puts them to sleep. My husband is amazing. Your friend is probably lying. (laughs) And you start thinking, why isn't my hubby doing that? Why isn't he helping me put the kids to sleep? Why isn't he throwing away the trash? Why isn't he doing what my friend's husband is doing? What is that? Coveting, jealousy, comparison. Your, coworkers, your coworker was your best friend and you guys were BFFs and things were amazing until your coworker got the promotion that you so wanted. Now you're like, I should have gotten that promotion. I work harder than she did. I am more talented than he is. I have more abilities than she does. Why didn't I get the promotion? And now there is conflict between you and your coworker. What is that? That is covening. You see what happens? That's why the Word of God says in James chapter 4, verse 2, you covet and cannot obtain. So what? You fight and quarrel. In other words, coveting leads uh, to conflict. And here's the thing about it. I want you to write this down. Here's the next point. Coveting leads to being hurtful and hateful. Coveting leads to being hurtful and hateful. Look at what the brothers, what the Bible says in verse 4. When his brothers saw their relationship between Joseph and the dad, that their father loved them more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Many of you know the narrative of Joseph. What do the brothers do? We've had enough of this. No way. This is no longer happening. All the 11 brothers, they decide that they want to get rid of Joseph. They actually try to kill Joseph, so they throw him into a pit. The oldest brother, Benjamin, says, wait a minute, we cannot kill our own brother. Let's take him out of the pit, and we're going to put him into a marketplace. I'm just going to give you the short version. We're going to put him in the marketplace, and we're going to sell him there so he can become a slave. Eventually, he becomes a slave of this wealthy man by the name of Potiphar. So we're going to get to that in a moment. So what they do is they actually take a piece off of his robe, they cut a piece of his garment, and they put goat blood on the garments. And so they throw the the, the brother to the pit. Eventually, they sell him into the marketplace. They come back with a piece of garment with goat blood, and they take it back to their father, Jacob, and they say, your favorite son, we were walking in the road, and we noticed that this is a piece of his garment. A wild animal killed your favorite son. He is now dead. They falsified the death of their own brother. Why? Because they were jealous of Joseph, coveting led to being hurtful, and it led to being hateful. Now, I'm sure all of us in here, we're not throwing someone into a pit. I hope not. Please, praise God. But guess what? We covet so much, something so much, or someone, that we begin to have a hateful heart towards someone else. We're frustrated. We're angry, we're bitter, we're discontent, we're disappointed, we are depressed, we are hateful, we slander, we use our words for malice. We have all these evil thoughts because we covet what someone has, and it deals and it leads to having conflict with other people. You see how dangerous it is to covet. And so Joseph's brothers, they coveted the relationship between Joseph and his father Jacob, and it led them to do all these evil and wicked things to their own brother Joseph. Now you may be asking the question, Pastor Carlos, I get it, I'm tracking with you, and I understand how important it is not to, not to covet something or to be jealous but how exactly do I deal with conflict? How exactly do I deal 
with family conflict. I want you to write this down as your next point for today. How to deal with family conflicts? Don't replay the hurts. Don't replay the hurts. So here's what happens in the story. Joseph is thrown into a pit. Eventually, he is sold as a slave, and he becomes a slave and servant of this man, this wealthy man who is actually a Pharaoh's official by the name of Potiphar. And here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 39. His master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. Now think about this for a moment. Joseph went from being his dad's favorite, having all the special treatment, being treated as VIP, to then being thrown into a pit by his own brothers. Then he was falsely, uh, they falsely said that he had died. They sell him out to the marketplace. Now he is a servant in this master's house. Rather than getting all the food that he wanted, Joseph is now cooking the food. Rather than being out and doing whatever he wanted to do, Joseph was now washing the dishes, cleaning the bathrooms. And the Bible says that Joseph found favor in the eyes of his master. The master saw that God was with them. Why? Because Joseph was joyful and content even in the midst of all the conflict that he had dealt with with his family. He was not complaining. He was not saying, wait a minute, I should not be here. My brothers did wrong against me. God, where are you? Why am I a slave now? Why am I a servant now? I should be back at home. But instead, everything he did, he did it with joy. He did not replay the hurts that his brothers had done. Can you imagine? Oh, I can't believe it. Benjamin did this to me. I can't believe my brothers did this to me. I can't believe that I was in this pit. God, where are you? What's wrong? Why am I in this situation? He was not replaying the hurts that had, that had happened to him by his own family members. And the Bible says that he found favor in the eyes of Potiphar. Maybe the reason why sometimes we don't find favor in the eyes of God is because we're coveting all the things that we don't have rather than being content with the things that we do have. Let me say that again. We are coveting so many things that we don't have rather than being content with the things that we do have. In the midst of the situation that Joseph is, was in, in the midst of intense conflict, Joseph was content because he knew the Lord was with him. And all throughout the narrative of Joseph, you see that the Lord was with Joseph in the pit, and he was with Joseph in Potiphar's house. In fact, Potiphar's wife uh, falsely accuses him of rape. Potiphar's wife wanted to be with Joseph, and Joseph did the right thing, and he flees Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife says, hey, Potiphar, that guy that you hired, the servant, that now he's a manager, he's a supervisor, he tried to rape me. So the Bible says that they throw him into prison, and here's what the Word of God says in Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 40, when Joseph came, this is in the prison, came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, he's in the prison, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. In the midst of being in the prison, Joseph is doing God's work. In the midst he was falsely accused. Potiphar's wife said, he tried to rape me. He actually did the right thing and he fled from her. It's like, I'm leaving this place. He's doing the right thing. And he's thrown into the prison. And so these officers are like, hey, wait a minute. We have all these crazy dreams and we've heard that you can interpret dreams. He tells, he tells them, yeah, talk to me, talk to me. 
I'm going to allow God to use me in the midst of this conflict that I'm dealing with right now. He didn't focus on what was going on around him, but rather he focused on the, on the pr- purpose of God. See what, what happens there? He's not replaying the hurts that he's having to go through in his journey as he's going through the pits and the prison, and eventually he'll go to the palace. Here's another thing that I want you to write down. How do you deal with conflict? Be a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Be a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Look what the Word of God says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So we mean peacemakers. Say it like you mean it, peacemakers. We've told you many times that the New Testament was first written in Greek and then translated into other languages. That word peacemaker in the Greek is the word makairos, and it means happy. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, you want to live a happy life? Be a peacemaker. You want to have a happy marriage? Be a peacemaker. You want to have a happy relationship with your parents, with your children? Be a peacemaker. Now, oftentimes when we think of the word peacemaker, really what we're thinking of is peacekeeper. Now, peacekeeper is good, but there's a difference between being a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. See, because a peacekeeper, it's all about maintaining the peace. It's all about choosing your battles. I tell people when I do premarital counseling, hey, in marriage, you got to choose your battles. You got to choose your battles. You can't argue about everything. You can't win them all. Your wife... 99% of the times is right. She's just right. Even if she's not right, she's just right. (laughs) Choose your battles. So being a peacekeeper, if you, you know, it's a Friday night and you're married and and you want ribeye, you want steak and a loaded potato and you want to go to Longhorn or Outback Steakhouse, but your wife wants seafood, make reservations at Red Lobster (laughs) or Golden Seafood. Have seafood. Maintaining the peace. If you want to watch an action movie, a thriller, action comedy, a ramble, or Fast and the Furious Part 17, I don't know how many parts they've had already, but your wife wants to watch a chick flick and My Best Friend's Wedding or Gilmore Girls or one of those other movies or shows, just do it. You're maintaining the peace. See, peacemaking is all about conflict resolution keeping, but peacemaking, it's all about conflict reconciliation. And there's a big difference. Let me give you an example. Several weeks ago, actually last week, uh, we had this event at our Doral campus. And so I took my two boys, Noah and Nathan, uh, to the event and Shawnee stayed at home with Everly. And so uh, they had a great day. They behaved really well. Well, I'm driving back home and I'm like, man, they've behaved really good all day. Driving back home, and I don't know what happened, but they start fighting, and it was bad. I mean, maybe your children don't fight like my boys, because they're more holy, more sanctified, but they were going at it with each other. And I'm like, driving, stop, 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 stop. So I'm trying to de-escalate the situation. Finally, they calm down, and they stop fighting, but that doesn't stop there. We get home. And I don't just want to de-escalate the situation, but I want to bring reconciliation between my both children. So I tell Noah, apologize to your brother. He's like, sorry. I'm like, apologize to your brother. Sorry. Give him a hug. He goes, I'll give him a fist pump. All right, just I'll take that. So he gives him a fist pump, and they, they start playing. They start hanging out. Everything's good. But as a parent, I don't just want to de-escalate the situation, but I want to bring reconciliation be- between both of my children. That is what being a peacemaker is all about. When there is an issue, you don't just want to de-escalate the situation and bring peace, but you want to bring reconciliation between that relationship. In other words, if there is an issue between you and a sibling, you want to bring reconciliation between you and your brother. If there's a situation between you and your father, you want to bring reconciliation between you and your dad. If there's a situation between you and your son, you want to bring reconciliation between you and your son. That's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. And that is the example of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate peacemaker. Because the Bible says 
every single one of us, we are all sinners. We are not perfect. We are imperfect. We are sinful people. And God the Father is perfect, flawless, sinless. And the only way that we can have peace with God is through Jesus Christ, God Almighty, because he died on the cross for you and I, and he is the ultimate peacemaker. How many of you believe that today at all of our campuses? Give Jesus a shout of praise. And so when you have conflict, be a peacemaker. Bring reconciliation between both, in between both relationships, both parties. Be that peacemaker. Here's the next point that I want you to write down today. Even in the midst of conflict, know that God is at work. Even in the midst of conflict, know that God is at work. Look what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 41. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, this is when Joseph was in the prison, you shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. He had him ride in a chariot as a second in command. Think about this for a moment. Joseph went from being in the pits to them being in the prison, and now he's in the palace. Even in the midst of all that conflict, think about it. Coveting was what breeded the conflict between the brothers and Joseph. God was using that conflict to accomplish his purpose. And he eventually, he would become second in command, one of the most powerful men of Egypt in charge right next to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh entrusted an entire land, group of people, under his care. Many of you know how the story unfolds, continues. His brothers, there was famine in the land of Israel, and his brothers would eventually show up to Egypt, and they actually bowed down to Joseph, and they had no idea that it was Joseph, because it was 13 years later. It was 13 years later that Joseph would finally go to the, to, to the palace, 13 years after his brothers had thrown him into a pit, so they didn't even recognize their own brother, Joseph. Joseph would eventually ask for, would eventually forgive his own brothers who did him wrong. And the word of God says the following in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph looks at his brothers and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. He says, what you guys did was wrong. He's not dismissive of their sin. He's not dismissive of their wickedness. He's not dismissive of their wrongdoings. He said, listen, what you guys did was evil. It was wrong. You guys are my brothers. You threw me in the pits. I was eventually a servant of a wealthy man. I had to work hard. And eventually I was falsely accused of something that I did not do and I was thrown into a prison. But make no mistake, all of that conflict, God used it for good. It doesn't end there. What people do against you is wrong. Sometimes we try to downplay the things that people have done against us. Oh, it's just sibling rivalry. You know, it's just, you know, brothers do that, you know, all the time. You know, fa families have issues, husbands, you know, dads do that all the time. No, it's wrong. Because the way we get over things is not by being dismissive. It's wrong. It was painful. It was painful what a sibling did to you. It was painful what your dad did to you. It was painful what a friend did to you. It's wrong. But it doesn't have to stop there. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. All things, not some things, not a few things, not only the good things, but all things happen for good. We may not see it. It took 13 years, 13 years before Joseph got to the palace. And I'm not saying that we're going to be in a palace one day. That's what that, the story of Joseph is about. But it took 13 years for Joseph to see what God was plotting and doing all along. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. There's this book by the name of seven women who have changed the world and 
One of those women is this woman by the name of Corey Tenboom. Maybe you've heard of her. She's a Christian woman. She passed away several years ago. And she's a Dutch, she was a Dutch Christian mo uh, uh, woman who actually, uh, she, what she did is she, uh, during the Holocaust, she actually smuggled many Jews into her home in Holland. And so she saved many, many women and she was smuggling them and put them in her home uh, to protect them. So eventually the Nazis actually f caught her and they imprisoned her and her sister Betsy and they put her into, into barracks, you know, and uh, jail cell and they, they were there. And so she writes about how the horrific things that happened uh, during her time there. She talked about the torture and the evil that she saw, the things that she heard. But one of the things that she talked about is during her time there, that in her barrack, there, they, they would sleep on these beds that were made out of straw. And there were lots of fleas that were in that bed. And they, those fleas would get on them. And so her sister Betsy, they told her one day, we need to thank God for everything. In every situation, God says, thank God for everything. And Betsy told her, we even, we even need to thank God for these fleas. She's like, you're crazy. I'm not going to thank God for these fleas. I'm not as Christian. I'm not as holy as you are. I'm not going to thank God for these fleas. And so what they started doing, they started having these small groups. And so they would smuggle Bibles. She writes in her books, they would smuggle Bibles. And they had these small groups with women there. And one of the things that they noticed is that the guards would never come while they were having the small groups. If they would come and notice that they were having the small group, they would be killed, harassed, tortured, raped. All these evil things could happen to these women. So they had small groups. Many women got saved. So eventually she was actually released and she would find out, I wonder why the guards would not come while we were having small groups in our barrack. I wonder why, why they would not come to the area that we were in. And eventually she would find out that the reason why they would not come is because of the fleas that were there. The officers did not want the fleas to get on them. So God used the fleas to protect them so they can minister the Word of God. And many women gave their life to Christ while they were imprisoned by these Nazis. Why? Because God uses everything for good. You may not notice it. You may not realize it. You don't understand it. Why did I have to go through this divorce? Trust me, there is something good that came out of that. God uses all things for good. How many of you believe that today at all of our campuses? Give Jesus a shout of praise. Let me pray for us. Father God, we just come before you, Lord. God, we're so grateful that we can come to this place and worship you, God. Thank you because you are the ultimate peacemaker, Lord. God, thank you because you are good even in the midst of our conflict, Lord. Even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of tragedy, God, you are there with us. Your word says that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You've never abandoned us, Lord. You are always for us, God. Your hand is never too short to heal and to save, God. And thank you, Lord, for your promises. Thank you, Lord, because you are so good to us. Maybe you're here today and you're joining us for the first time. And maybe as you hear this message about conflict and family issues, maybe you're here today and you're having some issues with someone in your family. Maybe it's a brother. Maybe it's a sister. Maybe it's your parents, children. Perhaps your next step today is to be that peacemaker and bring reconciliation to the relationship that is broken. I want to take a moment and I want to pray for you. I want to pray for those who are in the midst of conflict between a family member, or maybe it's just a friend, someone they considered a family member, and they did evil against them, they sinned against them, and, and they don't understand, why is this happening to me, Lord? I just pray, God, that we may live out your word, God. And at times, forgiveness is very difficult, but may we extend forgiveness and grace and mercy, Lord. I pray for our church. Maybe you're here today and you've never made a decision to follow Christ and you're far away from God. My friend, I want to tell you today that the Bible says that we are all sinners in need of saving, but only through Jesus Christ can we have everlasting life. The Word of God says if you believe with your heart that He is Lord, if you confess with your mouth if you believe with your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. And today you have an opportunity to make a decision to follow Christ.
Christ. There where you are, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you, but rather the condition of your heart. God wants your heart. He wants it all. He wants your entire life. There where you are, you can repeat the same exact words that I say, or you can pray something similar. Father God, I just come before you, and I recognize that I'm a sinner in need of saving. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you gave your life for me, God. Thank you for giving it all. Today, I ask you, Jesus, to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my best friend, to be my everything. Please forgive me of my sins. I repent. I turn away from my old life, and I run to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my best friend. It's in your holy and precious name that I pray. Amen and amen. Christ Fellowship, if you're excited for those that said that prayer, why don't we give it up for them? If you made that decision to follow Christ, make sure you go to our Next Steps area at one of our campuses. Uh, you can also text the word CF Miami to the number 313131. If you go to our Next Steps area, we have a Bible that we want to give you today. I love you, Christ Fellowship. I'm going to invite all the campus pastors to come up on stage. God bless you. Have an incredible day. Thank you, Pastor Carlos, for that amazing message on navigating conflict in our families and also the importance of forgiving others. Next Sunday, October 17th at 10.45 a.m., we're hosting our CF 101 experience. CF 101 is designed to help you see who God is, who we are, and how you can discover your place here at Christ Fellowship. Now, we host this experience on site and online once a month. To sign up, text the word CF Miami to the number 313131 and check off CF 101 on the connection card. At Christ Fellowship, we want those in need in our community to feel the love of Christ this Thanksgiving. And one of the ways we want to do this is by providing a Thanksgiving meal for the whole family to enjoy. Church family, we need your help to fill that bag. Bless a family by grabbing a bag and filling it up with the items on the shopping list and dropping it off at any of our campuses until November 6th. You can go to cfmiami.org slash fill that bag for more info and also for the shopping list. Next weekend, we will learn more about friendship from the story of David and Jonathan. Make sure to invite a friend or family member to join you and we will see you next week here at CF Online. Have a great week.